Hey there, want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are available on Spotify as well. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for podcasters, I've been able to reach more listeners as well as start earning advertising revenue. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hey everyone, how are you? I hope you are having an amazing day or evening depending on when you are tuning in. Before we get started today, I just wanted to give you a heads up. As some of you may know, I also have the Unpacking Podcast, and from time to time, I'm going to have episodes that I feel people who are looking for career-related information can truly benefit from. So I'll post them here, but don't worry, it's not going to be more than once a month, and it's going to be super awesome. If you'd like to hear more from Unpacking, check out the show notes below for the link. And today is one of those episodes. So this was originally created for the Unpacking podcast. However, this episode is on limiting beliefs with Ryan Browski, and it is so good. And as you guys know, the limiting beliefs can definitely impact your career. So I had to share on the Career Talk podcast as well. You are listening to the Career Talk, Learn, Grow, Thrive podcast, where we talk about all things career-related, and I really just tell you how it is. I'm your host, Stephanie Dennis, and my background is in human resources, which is what I have my master's degree in. My passion is helping others and sharing my knowledge, so I created this podcast. And this is a good time to mention, this podcast does contain adult language. All right, guys and gals, so we are here with Ryan, and we are going to be talking about limiting beliefs. So Ryan, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you are so passionate about limiting beliefs? Thank you, Steph. I appreciate you having me here today. So yes, this is a huge passion of mine. A little bit about myself is I am, for my full-time job, a corporate trainer. I train salespeople all around the country in the insurance business, and I also have a side life coaching business. So I do that after the nine to five is over, and a lot of what I work with when it comes to my clients is on limiting beliefs. So that's why uh, I'm very passionate about it. I've seen how they can create somebody into something they want to be or absolutely destroy them and not get them to where they want to go. So looking forward to talking through all that today. Yeah. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it as well. So why don't you start off maybe by telling us what exactly a limiting belief is, and then I'll dive into my many questions I have. (laughs) Perfect. So to start, I guess we could even start just at beliefs. Yeah. So beliefs are pretty much who we are. And like I said, they have the ability to create or destroy us. So we have very good beliefs, right, that are part of who we are, uh, whether it was our parents who instilled them in us or whether it is a friend or a relative. It could be anybody or some type of media we've consumed. And those are beliefs that we want to have if they empower us. And we'll talk about what is empowering, what is disempowering. Yes. So that's the ultimate, I would say, high level is just the beliefs. Now, when it comes to empowering, I would define that as a belief that gets you to where you want to go. So particularly speaking, results oriented, a lot of that is if you have a goal. So if your belief gets you closer to your goal, but beliefs also align with values as well. Yeah. And so we could even get into that a little bit. But what I work with a lot in the coaching realm is Ryan, I want to get to here and all right, let's look at some of your fears, your doubts, your beliefs overall, and what is empowering you to get closer and what is disempowering you. And the disempowering is taking you further away. Yeah. It's creating that fear. It's creating that doubt. And as a result, you're not taking action to get you to where you want to go. And the disempowering is our limiting beliefs. That would be our, that would, we would define that as our limiting beliefs. So what's the difference between limiting beliefs and simply just fear? It's a good question. So I always put fear into two categories. So there are some really good fears. Like I do not want to touch a hot stove. (laughs) You're going to get burnt. (laughs) Right, right. right. (laughs) So there's those fears that are legitimate fears. The problem is a lot of times we live our life based off of fears that are just feelings and not necessarily fact. Mm. 
So okay. one of my favorite quotes is the coward dies a thousand deaths and the brave man just once. Yeah. And what that is saying is oftentimes before we even try to do something, we create so much fear in our head, so much doubt in our head that we are from that perspective, not going to go after our ultimate goal. So that would be, I would say it's not that fear could fall within a limiting belief. Doubt could also be within a limiting belief, if that makes sense. So I it wouldn't does. know if I'd categorize them one or the other. They definitely can be integrated. But in terms of fear itself, there's really good fear. There's a lot of bad fear. And that bad fear that we have is just things that we've created in our head that we are associating a lot of pain with, but we've never actually, in most cases, have taken action to determine if that's going to create pain or not. Mm. So when you look at how do I tell the difference between a limiting belief and fear, is it whether or not you've been able to take action or is it something deeper than that? For example, right, if you are afraid to start a business because you feel like you're going to fail, however, you start your business, whatever it may be, you're, start, you're taking action, you're creating the content, you're putting it out into the world, you're still afraid it might fail, but you're still doing it. So would you say that when you're trying to identify what the difference between fear fear and limiting belief is that you are, if it's a fear, you're still taking action. If it's a limiting belief, it's preventing you from taking action or is it different? A lot of times limiting beliefs are preventing us from taking action. Okay. So I would, I would agree with that. In terms of the fear side of things, so your example was you are running a business or starting a business mm -hmm. and you're afraid that it may fail. Yeah. But in that scenario, you are still taking steps to start your business and actually run that business. Correct. Okay. So I feel like that's one of the biggest things when you talk to entrepreneurs that they don't ever start or they don't continue because they feel like they're going to fail. Yeah. So that would 100% fall into a limiting belief category if, if you are start. not taking action to start. Now, that, that being is. said, when you get started, that is probably the biggest thing to do, right? You have to start. Just to start. Take action. <laughs> However, beyond that, you're going to run into other fears and limiting beliefs. Yes. And so walk, go with me on this one. It's going to okay. sound a little crazy. <laughs> I'll go with you on so, it. So <laughs> a perfect example is, uh, so I started a life coaching business. Yep. And I took action on yep. something that, of course, you do a lot of consuming of content and you have been coached before and finally like, all right, it's time. I'm yep. going to take action. Did that. Went really well. And what happened is as I started to get clients, I remember my first paid client and I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, it works. I'm getting paid for my services. And I kind of like kicked my feet up, relaxed a little bit. Go I was me. Like, this is it. <laughs> yeah. Like, and it was a sense of complacency. But I would also say beyond that, there were probably some limiting doubts that I had within me. Like, is this, is, is this the max I could take this business to? Or is this, is this as far as I should go? Have I proven what I should or what I need to prove that I can make money off my services? So if you look at it as like a thermostat in a room, if your thermostat is set at say 68 degrees, Whatever you're doing, once you go beyond that, your body, your limiting beliefs is going to say, no, 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 come back down to where you belong. So mm. I'm taking action at that point. I've already started. I've gotten a paid client. I got to like 74 degrees and my natural instincts were like, no, 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 come back down. You belong at 68. And that would be limiting beliefs. And I would say there was, we could sit and capture those on probably what I felt at that time. So even though you take action, it does not mean that you're going to be essentially eliminate, eliminating those limiting beliefs, if that makes sense. No, that makes sense. So how do you change your new room temperature to 74 in your example? Like, how do you raise the bar? You, so you have to essentially, you, you have to raise the bar. So here's a good example. <laughs> At a high level, surround yourself with people who are going to make you raise your standards. Like if you want to see change, you have to raise your standards. Yep. And you can do that on your own. But it also helps if you're flying at the altitude of people who are at that level, right? Yeah. So that helps as well. So I was listening to this podcast and it, something came up and, it's, and the guy who was hosting it said, you can consider that a side hustle when you make $25,000 a year in addition to your regular income. Okay. And I said, wow, like most people run side hustles as either a hobby, maybe they make a grand or so a month. And it's not a bad thing. I would still categorize that as a side hustle. That's what I was but just thinking. But you want to surround yourself with somebody who says, no, make 25, we'll call that a side hustle. Ah, okay. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. Now my when... thermostat's going to be above 68. But if I didn't hear that, 
then I'm sitting here saying, I think I'm doing okay. So that's definitely a, a, more of a tactic, I would say, surround yourself with people who are going to make you raise your standards. What other, because I'm really big into like specific actions people can take, right? So a tactic is surrounding yourself with people who have higher standards. So you're raising your bar. Because in that example, as you were talking about, I'm like, I feel like $1,000 would be a good start to a side hustle, right? But then someone else is, you know, pushing you further to that 25. So that was at 22-ish a month. So what other tactics would you say that people can use to kind of raise that bar or bring up that temperature in your example? That would be an external tactic, I think. And what I find a lot of times when I'm coaching people is that a lot of it is internal in terms of it has to do with your identity. So when I talk about your thermostat, it's essentially your identity. So for example, when I work with somebody, I may find that they value people's opinions. Yep. And what they'll do is they'll have that need for love and connection, that need to make sure that they're building rapport. And so a simple example could be if you're meeting somebody, have you ever met somebody and they finish a sentence or they make a joke about themselves? Yep. Why? The self-deprecation. Well, it's perfect to connect with somebody, right? Like it's perfect. And like immediately like show some vulnerability. It's like, oh, this person's great. Like I connected them. They made me laugh. What I found is in business, a lot of people I've worked with have that personality, that identity, and it could be created through anything. I've seen divorces, I've seen sibling rivalries, just going back and looking at how people have developed these identities. And what happens is when you have that identity in business, it's detrimental. It's great for building rapport. It's great for having right. friends. But when it comes to you trying to take your thermostat from 68 to 75 to 80 to 95 over 100, and you're going to sit there and degrade yourself to build rapport or to connect with people, that's not going to help. You have to rewire that and you have to bust through that. So that would be a different strategy. Now, when you surround people, they could change you and things like that. But when it comes to why do you do that? Well, because back when my parents were fighting, I would be the mediator or I wanted to really get my my siblings approval and I knew I couldn't just shine because they were a little jealous of me. So I'd always pull back a little bit because I wanted their love. And because I wanted their love, I had to make funny jokes about myself. When you do that for 25, 30, 35 years, that's a hard habit. So (laughs) unconscious. It's so unconscious. And then I have these conversations and everyone's like, oh my goodness, you're right. Okay. We've done 25, 30 years of this. Let's start with our number one. (laughs) Grab the lightest dumbbell you can find (laughs) and we're going to start changing that thermostat. Got it. Okay. No, that makes sense. So talk to us a little bit about how you go about identifying a limiting belief because you just ran through a few different examples and took us back 25, 35 years in some people's cases. So when people are going through a situation and they have this thought that comes into their head, like how do you go about identifying those? It's a great question. And this is something I think everybody should at least consider doing an exercise on or getting around somebody who can. A lot of times you can't identify them on your own. Because you need somebody to kind of cover your blind spots. So a lot of the coaching that I do, that's what needs to be done. Now, when I am coaching somebody and I have them identify, what I'll have them do is write down their most empowering beliefs and then write down their most disempowering. So if you're listening to this right now, go ahead, grab some paper and a pen and write that down. And then once you go through that activity, what you need to do is then look at empowering, circle what beliefs you have that are empowering, maybe the top two or three beliefs there. And just reflect on how those beliefs are getting you closer to where you want to go in any area of your life, finances, relationships, career, health, doesn't matter, but write that down and then think to yourself, all right, how are these getting me closer? Then look at your disempowering beliefs, circle the top two or three, and just question the heck out of them. Why, why, why? Where did I develop this from? Okay. Who did I develop this from? (laughs) How is this limiting me to getting me to where I want to go? Was the person I learned this from worth modeling in that particular area of life? And essentially all you're doing is just creating doubt through your questions. And you want to create enough doubt on those beliefs, those disempowering beliefs, and enough pain. If you associate enough pain to those beliefs, you'll change them. Mm -hmm. When you write down what this is preventing you from getting... A lot of times you're going to stir up this pain and we do everything to either avoid pain or to gain pleasure. And you're going to say, that's it. I'm done letting these disempowering beliefs control me on where I want to go. Mm, That's good. So as you're saying this, I'm thinking through like some of what my limiting beliefs might be. And I'm thinking back to where did this come from? Like who gave me this thought, things like that. And part of it could 
be for others and myself a family. And so how do you go about overcoming your limiting beliefs, but then also not creating like a negative connotation with someone you might be really close with? Knowing that those beliefs all came from love. I mean, the majority of the yeah. beliefs we've gotten from family, it was not in a way to harm us. Yeah. It was in a way to make us feel more loved or for them to show love to us. Yeah. To kind of protect so it, it, or the intentions, guide. I guess I would say. Yeah. The, the intentions behind it. I mean, I guess there could be scenarios where the intentions weren't great. Uh, but but what I found is most of the time is the intention was love, right? Like yep. I wanted to protect you. So I didn't let you do things that took you out of your comfort zone. Yep. Or I wanted to guide you or save you from a particular pain that inadvertently. Right. And then perspective. I mean, how we fo- what we focus on determines how we feel. If you went through what you're, you said, say, hey, family could have created disempowering beliefs. I'm the same way. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's six that you identify there's a thousand that were really good empowering beliefs, totally. right? So when you, when you look at the perspective of that, it's like, all right, maybe there's two or three big ones, but let's not focus on those. Yep. We need to identify them and do that for our exercise. But for relationship purposes, focus on all the great things that we've been yeah. taught throughout the years. I love that. So one of the things I was thinking of, right, if we're going to unpack and be vulnerable, which is part of what the Unpacking Podcast is about, is one of them is kind of weight related. And I remember as a kid, just being younger, you know, I had the metabolism of like, I don't even know, but I could eat anything. Like I remember specifically nights with like my high school best friend ordering a large pizza. We were like size two, five, four, like teeny tiny little girls, <laughs> like large pizza down in half a gallon of ice cream. Like we could just eat anything we wanted. And I remember like my mom saying, hey, Seb, you have to be careful as you get Get older because one day you're just going to wake up probably in your mid to late 20s and like overnight it's going to feel like you gained 50 pounds and so that always stuck with me and of course late 20s is when I started to actually gain like a more weight than I would have in your freshman 15 or whatever in college Mm -hmm. and so that was one thing when you were talking about limiting beliefs that kind of stuck with me I was like oh and then I immediately felt like a little bit annoyed like why would my mom say that and then what you just said right think of all the good things it's like at the end of the day my mom taught me to be a very independent like badass woman so it's like who cares what your pants size is you know (laughs) which body love is a whole nother topic but no I love that just in case there's anyone out there who was having those thoughts that I will happily admit I was having. <laughs> well, and the, the other example of that is too, is oftentimes you'll hear like, don't call your kids dumb. I mean, if yeah. you think about out of rage, like you, you have a bad day at work, we'll yeah, say yeah. that. And you come home and what are you dumb? Yeah. And then your kid leaves the room crying and you're like, oh boy, that's going to be tough to yeah. unpack later in life. Because <laughs> right? what happens is, and you just walked us through that is subconsciously that is going through your mind. It's true. But now think about this with an empowering belief. If you had that empowering belief subconsciously throughout your mind, what does that lead to? Yep. And so that's where you get to that third part of, all right, we've questioned where they came from, really question them, and then we identify empowering beliefs. Yep. That's awesome. Love it. And so when I'm thinking about walking through limiting beliefs, part of me is also kind of drawing a correlation to affirmations. So maybe I can start by saying, once we've identified a limiting belief, how do you prevent that limiting belief from kind of creeping back into your to your thought space? Well, the first part is going to be identifying empowering beliefs. You create these empowering beliefs and you state them in the positive. So that's the start. You can model somebody who's successful in that space to create those empowering beliefs. You could get them from I mean, obviously that's the best place to get them from, but from other people around you or from a coach or somebody like that, you create those empowering beliefs. And then from there, you have to create confidence in those empowering beliefs. So you Mm. need to take action. Got it. Now that doesn't mean that affirmations are irrelevant. Affirmations are important, but affirmations are only as important as the action that you take. Mm, I love that. I feel like that's a tweet. (laughs) Could be a tweet because a lot of times you could say, I'm going to lose 15 pounds or I have what it takes to be a size two or whatever it could be. You could say, I I am going to get out of debt. I have the resources necessary to pay off my student loans. And you keep telling yourself this and it's like, well, you kind of have to create a budget. Right, right, right. right. (laughs) Kind of like spend less, pay off more, get a job that pays you more. You combine the two because as you just walked through before and everybody has experienced this, the subconscious mind is very powerful. So when it comes to reading those affirmations, that is subconsciously going to be ingrained in you. But if you compare that with action, 
then you're really, that's why you'll hear people say when you read your affirmations, if you have any, and if you're going through this activity and you've identified your beliefs, you've questioned them, you've created empowering beliefs and you're creating affirmations as a result, a lot of people will say, read your affirmations in a different physiology, like stand up, puff your chest out, right. shout them out loud. <laughs> and because that's changing your physiology, that's changing your state and that mm -hmm. is helpful, but there's nothing more helpful than getting confidence through actually doing something. Like, I would love to do a podcast interview. I can't wait to do a podcast interview. I'm going to be great at podcast interviews. Dude, at some point, you have to do a podcast interview. Right, right. <laughs> right? And exactly. then from there, you have that confidence. And I didn't get to the second part of that question because you said, what happens when the disempowering beliefs come back in? Yep. So we run this interview. I listen to it. And I say, wow, that wasn't the greatest interview. There's two ways that can go. Can I just give up and say, all right, I'm no longer going to do this. I'm not cut out for those interviews. I don't have what it takes. Or can I say, what can I learn from that interview? There were some things that I did a little bit different. I just wrote down, don't say like all the time. I always say that. that doesn't <laughs> I'll probably mean that, edit out a lot of your likes anyway. <laughs> that, does, that doesn't mean that I can't do these interviews. But what it does mean is you look at that as an opportunity to build off of that. Yep. Everything I tell my clients all the time, don't get caught by your thoughts. You can acknowledge them, but let them fly right by. But don't get caught by those thoughts because the second you get caught by those thoughts, you're preventing yourself from getting to where you want to go. Like the thought can come back in, recognize it, and then tell it just to be on its way. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> but it, that seriously is how it, how it should work. That is easier said than done. For Particularly sure. Particularly on some limiting beliefs that have been built into us that have a lot of emotional intensity. Hmm. So we could have experiences that have happened in our life that carry a ton of emotion with them. Yes. And they could be listening to this podcast saying, you really want me to just let that thought go by? Right. Like, what the fuck do you know? <laughs> right. Exactly. You want to talk about unpacking. <laughs> right, right. I mean, there are some yeah. very deeply driven emotional thoughts in people that create these limiting beliefs where it's tough. And that's why when I coach people, we're often unpacking and really identifying what these are and questioning them. And to see someone's face when you go so deep into that and realizing that that is not how they should be defined is a game changer. Yeah, for sure. So that brings up another question because there is like my example was a little bit more, I feel like surface level, but there's definitely, you know, some more, you know, emotional type of limiting beliefs that people have. So how if people are going through this exercise on their own and they haven't yet, you know, sought the help of a life coach or someone who can assist them in that, how do they kind of go through the exercise and go through the process, but also be sensitive to the fact that there is a lot of emotional weight behind it and kind of care for themselves in the process, if that makes sense? That's a really good question. So to start, I would say it really depends on where you want to go and what you want to get. And we could put this in two categories. I work a lot of times in results of getting people in their career and their business. That being said, I look at every aspect. So relationships will come into this. So if you have a goal to find yourself a wonderful Prince Charming, right. and that's what you want, <laughs> let's look at some limiting beliefs. All men suck. <laughs> right? I sh Ryan says <laughs> this one because I specifically shared last week that I've heard my mom say that so many times. <laughs> I honestly don't believe that to be true, but she has gotten to the point in her life where she believes that is true. <laughs> so, so when you look at that one, it's a, re it's a perfect example. Yeah. Because it could go into so many different areas where yeah. if you look at that, so let's call that out. You know your end game goal. You yep. want to find your Prince Charming. You throw that down as a limiting belief. One of the things that I've noticed with limiting beliefs is they're extremely general. So we generalize. That's just how we go through. And it's just our brain just shortening things. It's like, like we a see, stereotype almost. Yes. Yeah, we see a few yeah. things and we're like, so this is what it means. And that's just to give us some more capacity. Yep. What happens is we go on cruise control and we just generalize and generalize and generalize. And that's my favorite part. The brain part is of, lazy, right? Oh, it's my favorite part <laughs> as, a, as a coach. Because from there, you can really start to pick that apart. Well, why do all men suck? Yeah. Or why do all recent grads have to carry student loans? Right. Everybody has student loan debt. Really? Definitely not everybody. <laughs> not everybody. Some of my bossy friends like to tell me when they don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you think about that, you have these generals. Or how about this? Student loan debt is normal. It doesn't have to be, though. Right. Right. But how yeah. many people think it is? Oh, probably most people. I'll never pay my student loans off. Oh, I hear that one a lot. Right? Yeah. For sure. I mean, that's just 
I'm getting so excited just talking about this <laughs> because I'll tell you a personal example on that. That was something to where you want to walk through beliefs. This is a perfect example. So my wife and I, I don't mean to be that person, but we paid off our student loans. Yeah, no, be that person. <laughs> so we paid off. But if you could imagine, we had that student loan debt's normal. Yep. Student loan debt, this shouldn't be paid off before that final date. It should be a 10-year plan, whatever it may be. For your 72, right? Yeah, and then you question where that came from. And you're like, well, obviously that came from a lot of our peers because we all went to college yeah. and we're all around college grads and we all carry debt for the most part. And what you have to do is question beyond that, how do I create empowering beliefs? We decided to follow Dave Ramsey. Yeah, I was just so we ask modeled if you did. somebody. We modeled somebody in that space. Yep. And you could change this to fitness. You could change this to a relationship coach or any uh, anybody in that area who can help you out. And you find somebody or anybody who's in a great relationship. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right? You want a yep. good marriage? Ask somebody who's in a great marriage. Yep. So sometimes when you simplify it, it's like, oh my goodness. So we did that, and then all we did is create empowering beliefs. And we took action and we made one payment, we made two payments, three payments, yep. bigger and bigger. And next thing you know, it was gone. It was that four step process as simple as can be. The biggest thing that drove us to action on that though, as I said earlier, was we do things to either avoid pain or gain pleasure. When you look at the interest on student <laughs> oh, loans. Oh, it's painful. <laughs> it got to a point where, where payments were actually not helping the balance. Right. And we both looked at each other and said, We've had it. So when yeah. people say, how do I get out of debt? Or when I'm talking to people, because I'll coach personal finance as well, just from my experiences, yep. I'll say, this version that I'm talking to is not going to get out of debt. Let's talk next week, and I'll let you know maybe if your, ne your next version shows up, if you'll get out of debt. Because yeah. it really takes that, I've had it, I'm, I'm sick done. of it. That's leverage, that's doubt, that's questioning your beliefs and saying, this is going to be out of my life. Yep. No, that makes total sense. So we've talked about identifying the limiting beliefs. We've talked about digging deeper into that, helping people or getting help, I should say, to see those blind spots. We have then countered that limiting belief with an empowering belief. So I guess the question now is like, then what? Then what do you do? And that's going to be where you have to take massive action. I mean, not little spurts, but you have to go all in. And this is where you're going to, you talked about fear earlier is where you're going to reveal that fear is actually a feeling and not a fact. Mm. So an example of this could be, I work with sales folks a lot, yep. and networking events scare the crap out of people. <laughs> Right? They don't know if it's, it's going true. to... They don't I know. laugh because I yeah. used to be that person. That's why I laugh. <laughs> well, perfect. And now you don't mind going to networking events. Now I could go... I go to the bar and have dinner belly up all the time by myself and talk to random people. Okay. And what changed from that initial belief versus where you're at now? I think I realized that one, I... you Okay. So <laughs> talk about limiting beliefs. I was told as a little kid that I was very shy. And the fact was that I wasn't shy. I just didn't have anything to say. So I was constantly, <laughs> no, seriously, I was like constantly around like adults because I, I thought adults were cooler and they had better conversation. So I was just like such a nosy kid and I would go sit with all the adults. And it's not that I was shy, but it's like, what am I going to contribute to an adult conversation when like you're seven, you know, like they're talking about dating or whatever. I'm like, well, what do I know? Like, so I just sat there and listened. And so that I was told, oh, Steph's just really shy. And the reality is I'm not shy and I'm very curious about people. And so I just eventually started to ask people, you know, like I would overhear someone say to the bartender at the bar, right? Oh, you know, such and such comment. And I'd be like, oh, well, that's interesting. And then I would add to that, you know, so I would just like kind of like insert myself into a random conversation. So not shy at all, but more so curious. And then I started asking people more and more questions as I met more and more new people. And it's really amazing that you find out like there are a lot of super cool people in the world. <laughs> so I just kept doing it over and over and over again. <laughs> That is perfect. And that's what we talk about when it comes to taking action. And I don't know if you could remember, but that first time when you're like, I'm going to go out of my comfort zone and ask that. And the person didn't ignore you. They didn't run from you. They didn't call you weird. And guess what? You could do that tonight and somebody may run from you, yeah. may ignore you and call you weird. <laughs> but you have so many references that you've done this on that it's built yeah. up enough confidence to where if that does happen, you're not going to feel that way. Yeah. You, you may have that doubt creep in your say, wait, am I really? So if we went through 10 times, because this is where taking action, you actually have to do it a lot. A lot. A yes. lot. So yes. say you take that same example, which I have so many questions on that. That was perfect. <laughs> Go but for say it. you take that same example and I'm coaching you. 
Yep. And I know that to get you to where you want to go, say if you want to host this podcast and make it a huge podcast, you have to meet people. Yes. So I know that that's your end game goal. You know that that's your end game goal. Yep. But you feel that you are shy and that you don't want to go out and meet people and go to networking events. Are you going to get to your end game goal? Definitely not. No. Okay. So let's talk about what you need to do to get there. Yep. And we would go through everything that you just went through. How did you identify that it wasn't that you were shy? It's just that you didn't have much to add. Because that's a good level of awareness that <laughs> yeah. gave you that confidence. So was that something you've always had on your own or is that something you've noticed down the line? Yeah, no, I am an overly aware person to the point of it being a little bit like annoying. I always call it my ability to therapy myself is like sometimes ridiculous. However, I was listening to, it was a podcast and I don't remember who it was, but they were talking about outgoing introverts. And I was like, this is it. This is it. This is what people don't understand. And so I will explain that to people 10 times over again because I'm very outgoing. I can go to a group of people. I can make small talk, right? That's how Ryan and I met. We were at like a, what, happy hour for our apartment building. And we just ran, I started talking to his wife and then we all started talking together. But as soon as I hit my like max, like when I'm tired and I need to recharge, it's like with the dog watching Netflix and no one has to be around. Like it's by myself, sure. right? So it's like, right, how introverts recharge. And so when it was framed up that way, I was just reflecting and I was like, okay, that is me. That's how I recharge and I am an outgoing person. But why did I think I was shy? And I think I was just like, me and my mom were having a conversation with like someone else in the room and she's like, well, Steph was really shy as a kid. And I look at her and I was like, I wasn't actually shy. I just didn't have anything to say. <laughs> and she was just kind of like an aha moment. But it's like those times where it's like you can, I can usually identify, but not always. Like everyone has blind spots, right? But yeah. Yeah. So you shift your identity from being shy to being curious. Super curious. Think about the, the opposite end of that really in terms of networking to where you want to go. Yep. My mom always used, I'm a middle child. She used to say, we used to have to look in the back of the car to see if Ryan was still there. Oh. Right? Think about that. <laughs> And like, there's topics that I won't shut up on. And my wife's like, can you just be quiet? Right. <laughs> so it's like, so how does the, the, is he in the back of the car still here versus, right, I'm going to need you to just quiet. Like, can we just watch Netflix or something right, just when I'm so quiet? <laughs> yeah. So, but that again, that's an identity shift. And once you get congruent with your identity, your beliefs will follow with that. And then to where you want to go, look out. Yep. I okay. love to tell people the most powerful force in the world is being congruent with your beliefs, your identity, and your mission. So how do people know what their identity, I mean, your beliefs, I feel like you just naturally know, right? But how do people know what their identity and their mission are? Well, that the mission is definitely probably another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you had like a quick elevator pitch we can just add in. <laughs> uh, so we could go through from the, let's start with identity. So when it comes to identity, if we look at your example for identity, we could look at the fact that your identity was that you were a shy person, right? That's what I was told. That's what you were told? Yep. And so, well, that was your identity, essentially, before you... Before I realized, realized I wasn't. Realized it, right. Yep. So that was just a shift in that identity when you realized it. You just called bullshit. Got it. And then you went through that. So that's an identity shift. So like the thoughts you own about yourself is your identity. 100%. Got it. And identity could be good or bad. I mean, yep. if you look at identity of some of the worst people out there, that's their identity, right? And right. that's could be a product of their surroundings. Like my identity could be I am in a gang or my, like that's your identity. Right. My identity is I'm wearing a football jersey. That's my identity. Right. Like you see these people who retire from sports and their identity is stripped. True. And that causes issues. A lot of times it's because their mission isn't big enough. So when mm. you look at an athlete, and they retire and all of a sudden they go into a depression and they look to supplement their needs that they had that athletics filled or even a college athlete. And then all of a sudden they can't connect with people. All of a sudden they can't find their uncertainty that they want that came with athletics, their love and connection, their significance. That's a serious identity crisis. Yeah. So when it comes to the mission, every time I work with somebody, I challenge them to think massive, think yeah. big. Perfect example. Tom Brady is on a mission right now. And he has a company called TB12 Sports. And TB12 is all about empowering athletes all over the world, 
to be the best version of themselves and avoid injury because Tom okay. is like 75 years old and still winning Super Bowls. <laughs> is he so, really? So he's not no, 75. He's not. I don't know anything he's, about Tom Brady. He's 45, but Got this it. could relate to anything. Oh, this that... could relate to anything. He might not be 45, but he's in his 40s. Okay, fair enough. So when he retires, say he goes down with uh, injury tomorrow and he has to be done with football. He's living more than that. He has his new brand. He's going to empower athletes everywhere. He's already started. Got LeBron it. James is more than an athlete. That's his identity. He hashtags things on Instagram with it. Right. <laughs> That's essentially saying when my athletic career is done, LeBron's just getting started because I'm more than an athlete. Got it. So when I coach people, I think, let's get big. Let's, let's think as big. big as possible. And then from there, let's get your beliefs and identity to align because once those are congruent, watch out. Like once you realize that you want to build a massive podcast and you have this mission and you know that it's going to take networking to get there, and you know that you are not somebody who's shy. In fact, you're somebody who's curious. And by the way, curiosity is the best way to connect with people because you're not going to be talking the entire time. It's true. Right? Because people hate to listen to you talk about you. Exactly. Yeah. Well, look out. Like, who's going to stop you? Nobody. Uh, that's, that's where, yeah, that's where <laughs> it gets. Now, you want to look at the other side of that equation, and I see this too. Say you are the child who needs to be the center of attention. Who would you rather be? Not that kid. Because <laughs> at a networking event, you're just going to walk around the room and talk about yourself. I've seen those people at networking events, and I am very curious, but not curious enough to engage. I sure. feel like there you need to know when to engage and when not to engage. Could you now see how coaching is a profession? <laughs> right. But, I no, mean, when totally. you think about this, when you think about dealing with you know 50 different people, 50 different backgrounds, 50 different experiences, more than that, but like parents telling them different things. That's just going to create so much opportunity to rewire, get people to where they are. Now, going back to taking action, you are extremely confident right now. We said if you were to walk out and somebody ignored you, you probably may have a little unconscious thought about being shy, but you're going to get over it pretty quick. If yeah. we were, if I was coaching you and I challenged you on that because I know where you want to go and I said next Tuesday, I want you to go to this networking event and you go to that networking event and you have this that This is porn. super creepy. I actually have a networking event Tuesday. Okay, perfect. But this isn't a good example because I'm the host, but oh, that's okay. okay. <laughs> so if you were to go to that event after just changing your or creating an empowering belief that you are curious and you're a great connector and the first person you talk to ignores you or doesn't give you the time of day, is that an accurate reflection of who you are? No. I had someone just ignore me like a week ago. I went to that dessert bar downtown and I tried to talk to the lady next to me and she literally like made eye contact out of like the corner of her eye and like consciously like moved her body away from me I was like okay <laughs> yeah but does that define you <laughs> no does that define a lot of people if that happens to them though probably 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 but it could be somebody you've all been to networking events like I gotta get to that person in the corner of the room yeah Steph it's you all right I gotta go I gotta go or they're on an agenda or maybe they had a bad day like you don't know what it could be yep. but that is what happens so when it comes to taking action we would tenfold that. It's similar to rejection in sales. If you only call 10 people, you're going to be hurt. Oh, they'll probably all say no because I'm you pretty have sure to the call numbers are 100 less. people. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, you start to build references. So yeah. that last step, then what? It is take massive action, not just once, not just five times, not just 10 times, but hundreds and thousands of times. And when you look at somebody who is perfecting their craft, and playing at that high level or performing at that high level, whether it's an entertainer, athlete, or a business person, they have so many references to back up their belief that it's at some point insanity. So would you say that massive action is... So when I think of repetitive action versus massive action, would you say that repetitive or massive is going to be more impactful? And I ask that thinking like, if you take massive action, like I want to change the world. So I'm going to go from being Stephanie who has her nine to five corporate job to taking massive action and building a school in a third world country for kids who don't have school. Like that's a massive action versus maybe just starting a local donation. Right. So like, is it more of like a repetitive or something big in terms of the action itself? I think a lot of that depends on where you're at. Ah. So if you're in a spot where you are going to build a school, but you are maybe extremely have a ton of resources and it doesn't seem that far off, then that's probably going to be massive action for that person is, all right, you're here. We're going to take the leap there. Got it. When it comes to if you want to build a school right now, 
massive action could be who do you need to connect with in the community that can educate you on what it takes to build a school okay you're just taking smaller steps it's all relevant and maybe that whole that question comes in the same way for that other example we just talked about but for example massive action for you right now would be go to 10 networking events in the next month sure the stuff that thought she was shy massive action is that would go grab coffee with one person yeah uh, right you see see how that that works that's that would feel like massive action as well right. when you're saying I am a shy individual. So think yep. big, start small is Got typically it. how we work. It's just a matter of what's your definition of small. Like LeBron okay. James just built a school in Cleveland, Ohio, like that with his foundation. But that's very likely for somebody who has that amount of resources. Say probably millions. Things like that. <laughs> right. So yep. that works. But let's just take that down to the scale of, okay, I want to have coffee with one principal and talk about how yeah. that could impact a school like that could impact a community. Got it. So limiting beliefs, turning them into empowering beliefs, turning that into your identity, which is the thoughts you own about yourself, and then taking that to taking action and then thinking even bigger, right, as your mission. So I feel like taking action is kind of like what you're doing on the daily or the weekly, but then your bigger mission is like, what's your ultimate end goal? And like, how do you recommend that people look at that? Because I think like, if I was to say, what is your your dream goal, right? Is to create, you know, this massive media company that can help people improve their lives. So that's way beyond a successful podcast, right? That could be in all sorts of different forms. So like, how do you say that's a good mission or I need you to dream bigger? Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. So you're essentially asking, is this big enough for a mission? Just in general. So like I'm already telling you when you said that my mission is to create like a successful podcast and to do that, right? So like in my brain, I'm always thinking it's bigger than that. (laughs) Yeah. But I know there's some people who can look at that and be like, oh my gosh, one successful podcast. And I'm not saying that that's not a good thing. That's an amazing thing. I guess like how do people know if their dreams are big enough? Like if the mission is big enough. They don't scare you. That's fair. (laughs) I got it. You write down a mission and you feel extremely comfortable. (laughs) Yeah, I can do it. No yeah. problem. 2019. I'm gonna, done. I'm gonna strive to be clean and shower three times a week. I don't, I don't know. But like, if it really, if you go through that and you don't That's sense fair. some type of fear, fear, or just some type of, I mean, if it scares you or anything along, uncomfortableness. Yeah, like yeah. you have to be a little uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. If it doesn't yeah. make you uncomfortable, it's not a big enough mission. So that is going to be where you start to say how how big should this be. Yep. You know, and then from there you can pivot too. I mean, missions can change and things like that, but to at least have that target to hit, because if you don't have that target, you're not going to hit anything. You have nothing to aim at. And then from there, it's very difficult to implement that process we just talked through if we don't really have anywhere to go. I don't really have a reason to get out of my comfort zone and meet somebody for coffee if I'm shy. Right. Why, why would I do that? I'd rather sit in and watch Netflix, which by the way, if you're happy, is perfect. <laughs> totally, you don't have to do it. Totally. I think that's a good point. A hundred percent. You don't have to do that. You know, that's why it's, we talk about where do you want to go? Well, yes. now I have some leverage as a coach to get you off your ass. Right, right. <laughs> but if you don't want to do that and you are the happiest person alive playing Xbox, do you Fortnite? <laughs> right. do it if that's a sustainable model and it keeps you happy for sure so that's the other part of that that we don't talk about often because i usually work with people who obviously want to get they're in one spot and they want to get to another or they're in one spot and they want to maximize where they're at yeah and i think if someone's coming to you for coaching they're probably already sensing that unhappiness or that something needs to change So I'll end with this. What have you not covered as it relates to limiting beliefs in our conversation that you feel like we should have? Or if is there anything else that you would like to share? Yes, I would say, well, we kind of talked about it a little bit. So we talked about congruent identity. This is something I'm passionate about as well as incongruent identity, like Instagram. So when it comes to people and what they share on social media, they will have different identities. Oh, man. (laughs) That's a big one that comes up as well in terms of not being happy. So a lot of times you'll see people living their Instagram social media life. And when it comes back, and people have heard this before, so this is nothing new, but I think in the context of our conversation, it may have a little bit more power to it. Okay. So we talked about the power of being congruent with your identity and your mission. Oftentimes when you see depression and unhappiness from people, it's because on social media they're living one life. Maybe their core values and beliefs are over here and there's no congruency with their identity and where they want to go. And that's dangerous. 
So that's something that I work with a lot of times with people. And that's pretty quick to call out, but that goes along the lines of stop caring what other people think. Yeah. That's if I had a dollar for every time I've said that. And in fact, the day you stop caring what other people think about you is the day your entire life changes. It's very true. Because when I work with people on career finance, when you're trying to get out of debt, you're not wearing the nicest, newest clothes. I was going to say, you ain't doing nothing fancy. (laughs) You're you're eating in a lot, right? You're saying no to bars and restaurants. I'm in a lot of tacos. But if you care what other people think, you're not getting out of debt. So something we haven't really talked about a ton here today, but goes through everything, personal finance, relationships, career, business, leadership, impact. You really have to have that point where you say, I don't care what other people think. Yeah. No, and not, not to be arrogant. No, no, no. But, but no, you have to not care though. Like I remember when I kind of came to the realization, I think it was probably like mid to late 20s. And I'm like, what if I just didn't give a shit? Like Susie Sue over here doesn't like my hair. Don't give a fuck. And you know what I mean? Like, I don't care. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And like, cause I don't, I don't remember what the ex- exact thing that happened, but someone made like a negative comment towards me and I'm like, and it was like, I don't even know it, in my opinion, had no like justification, but I was like, and like, why are we talking about this? Right. Like go away. Yeah. But that, that's what happens when you have a bigger mission. Totally. And Tony Robbins always says, he says, don't major in minor things. When yeah. you don't have a big mission, it's very easy to major in minor things because there's nothing else to focus on but minor things. It's but true. when you have a big mission to build a media company that impacts people, you don't have time. You don't have time when to you, care. When you want to get out of debt in two years, you don't have time to argue with someone why you can't go out to eat. No. You're you just not to. going. It's, it's no different than parenting. Right. right. And I'm not even a parent, but I would imagine if you want, like, no, you're Mom, not going Mom, why can't out we do tonight. this? Because I said so. Because I said <laughs> yeah. so. And it's like, you take that stance with your kids, but then a peer comes to you mm. and all of a sudden you're shaking in your boots because you fear that they're going to think of you some way. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. And then, so when it comes to the minor things, now when it comes to the major things and someone says, Steph, I built a company and this is what my company does. And you say, I don't give a shit. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you wouldn't say that, but that's where you look at it and you say, all right, where's the line on that? Who do I not have to care about? What do I not have to care about? What should I care about? Why does this sound so simple? You know, it's not simple, <laughs> but well, it doesn't I, it sound so simple when we just talk about As you're about talking it. about it too, and I think that's a good point, is like I think there's also a line when it comes to not giving a shit what other people think about you and what you're doing, but also being respectful, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, when whoever this lady was made a negative comment about me, I easily could have been like, screw you, you're blah, blah, you know, and like fired back and I'm like, okay. You know, like, and just walked away. Like, right. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I remember when I first moved to Southern California, I went to Target in, like, the upside down, terrible, didn't even try to make it a messy bun bun, like, didn't give a shit, sweatpants, old t-shirt, and flip-flops. And all of those Southern California stay-at-home moms looked at me like, what the hell? And I was like, I don't care. I need water and dog food. Like I have shit to do. But like, I literally, I counted like because I said so. <laughs> like yeah, over like five people who are just gawking at me. I'm like, why do you care so much about my man sweatpants? Like <laughs> right. Like, really, with the Lululemon yoga pants. Like I just don't care. I don't want to wear those yoga pants. <laughs> it's like the it's the whole block out the haters thing. I mean, totally. We've, we've been around this for so long, and to hear that, and that's so that's something I'm definitely passionate about. That comes up a lot of times in coaching conversations. The other thing, I work a lot with career and helping people find what they're good at, what they're passionate about. If they're unhappy, I try to make them happy in their career by just asking questions, so that way it's they huge. can discover it. And a yeah. lot of times that does require a career jump, maybe an income decrease, or maybe you get more income as well as yep. part of that shift. One of the things that I pride my coaching on is creating that bridge between where you're at and where you want to go. So there's a lot of people out there on social media who will say, just go and do it and jump. jump. <laughs> and and it, to, there's truth to that, but there's and. also a lot of validity. And I just spoke to somebody last week who, as of yesterday, is officially an entrepreneur. It was his nice. last time working for that company. Wow. And he saved up enough income to get him through the year. That's awesome. Well, let's talk about how to get you on a financial plan to do that. Yeah. Actually, his was two years, which is pretty damn impressive. I was going to say so that. So now, now you have a runway. Exactly. I could talk to another person who was like, well, I just hated my job and I'm quit and we'll figure it out. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> sure. I mean, there's people out there who have done that. Sure. But let's play the probability here. And now I may be coming off as a practical life coach, but I'm here to set you up for success. 
And I'm here to coach somebody to set up two years of income and then make that jump. And this is right. just career speaking. Yeah. But that's another conversation that comes up quite a bit. But then a lot of that gets back to limiting beliefs of I can never do that for my career because I don't have that income. And I can say, well, I just talked to somebody who saved up two years of their income and now they're pursuing their dreams. Oh my goodness, it's full, full circle. circle. <laughs> it's full circle, but yes. All right, so where can people find out more about you if they want to work with you, all of that good stuff? I'm very active on social media. So Twitter at Ryan J. Borowski, and that's B-O-R-A-W-S-K-I. Uh, Instagram as well. That is Ryan Borowski on Instagram. And I also have my website, which is ryanborowski.com. And what you can do is on my website, there's a button for a free coaching call. So I give everybody a free coaching call just to see if we would be a good fit. There's a link on there where you could sign up for a time. And then I'll introduce myself, give you a little background for like 90 seconds and we go. Like we get right into it and we just see if you'd be... In fact, I have one coming up here in a little bit and we'll find out in an hour if it's a good fit or not. So that free coaching call is always out there. In terms of my other social media stuff, follow that. It's more of a macro level. At this point, I don't have any webinars with multiple people. It is very one-on-one -on -one based, okay. but I do post a lot of content out there on things that I'm reading, things that I've heard. So you can definitely follow that for some motivation or any type of coaching that you would want through a social media platform. Awesome. And I will have the links to all those in the show notes. You guys, if you didn't catch the spelling of that, no worries. I got you. Ryan, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This was awesome. Let's do it again. For sure. All right, everyone. I hope you found the information helpful and valuable as always. Thank you so very much for taking the time to listen to the podcast. I really do appreciate it. You can find the episode show notes over at stephdennis13.com. And if you would like to contribute to the podcast, you can do so via PayPal, and I'll leave that link in the show notes as well. That really will help us keep the podcast going and also help me find an editor, <laughs> which would be so very amazing. Uh, if you're enjoying the podcast, please take a minute to leave a rating and or review. I would really appreciate it. You can find me over on the socials over at Facebook and Instagram at StephDennis13. You guys are so awesome. Thank you so much and have an amazing rest of your day.